Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's WTG webinar session. My name is Akil, and I will be moderating today's event. Our topic today is Be Prepared for the Escalating Talent Shortage, and will be presented by Bruce Morton. Before we begin, please let me explain the various tools available during today's session. This session is using audio broadcast, so you should be hearing me through your computer speakers or headphones. If for any reason you have a problem with the audio, please send me a message via the chat box to the right and I will enable your dial-in details. You may also have noticed that you can only see your own name in the participants list as well as your own chat messages and messages from the panelists. This is down to the purposes of privacy and there are many of your peers and colleagues from around the world again joining anonymously. If you need assistance, please contact me through the chat box and if you would like to pose a question to the speakers, then please use the Q&A box. Simply type your question and we will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. This leaves me with nothing more to say, but to welcome today's presenter and hand over the floor. Bruce Morton, you are now live. Thanks, Akil, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. As Akil mentioned, we have a good, uh, nice global audience for today's call. Um, so I'm Bruce Morton, Head of Innovation for Allegius, and uh, just as form of introduction, I've been in this wonderful industry of ours for um, 34 years now, um, and counting. Um, English, living in the U.S., and spent some time in various parts of the world. Um, and Allegius, for those that don't know, you can see the highlights here. I'm not going to dwell on this, and um, hopefully most of you on the call and know our organization. I think the important point to stress is that what we're talking about today is we'd like to share some of the knowledge, expertise, and experience that we've gained um, over the last years and months in terms of how we think about the, um, the skill of talent acquisition in this ever-changing world, um, in this ever-demanding world of um, where, um, I love this cartoon here, where is everybody? A lot of our clients and prospects say that to us. Uh, why is it getting so hard? Why is it getting more difficult? Um, in the wonderful world of everything being enabled by technology, why is it that in some reasons it just seems harder and harder to actually find that great talent? and what's really causing that talent shortage. So um, I'll spend the next couple of slides just stating the blindingly obvious, but I think we all know this. We all live in this world. Um, I'm concentrating here on the UK. Um, this, this is where the um, webinar has been hosted. But um, we all know that uh, um, these uh, talent shortages and the problems it's creating is certainly not limited to the UK. We're feeling it here in the US and certainly our Asia business as well. Um, it's not just the fact that it's getting harder for us as organizations. It really is impacting this economic growth period that um, hopefully we're sustaining. Um, recent news um, uh, put aside, I think that everybody agrees that we're, uh, we're in this growing economy where the candidate is certainly um, back in charge, if they ever weren't. Uh, it's certainly a, a candidate-driven market, and I think in those specific skill sets, like the, uh, we have here from the RHC in terms of IT, programs developers, um, in the healthcare is the other real um, demanding area. And probably the, the biggest shortage of all is in the world of, of engineering. Um, there are some green shoots, good news coming out recently around the fact that um, uh, graduate, sorry, um, college students that are being interviewed are now more likely to go into STEM skills than they were a couple of years ago. But as we all know, it will take some time for those people to come through the system to really impact our ability to find that talent. So as we think about talent these days, we certainly think about it on a global scale um, and think more about how can we get work done and where can we get that work done as opposed to um, just a few years ago when it was all about trying to hire those people locally. Um, but I guess the big question is the so what, and the so what as we think about it from an HR and talent acquisition perspective is now is the time, now is our moment in the sun where we really do have a phenomenal positive uh, or can have a phenomenal positive impact on an organization. And I use this phrase, we need to talk, um, which is <laughs> puts dread in uh, most men for some reason when we hear that from our partner. But what I mean by that is now is the time as talent acquisition or HR experts and professionals to try and stop the 
planet and get off and actually have these conversations with the business heads in a real deep and meaningful way. We all know that we're in this ever, a bit like a hamster running in a wheel and there's always open legs to fill. Everybody wants everything yesterday. But unless we can control that situation and really take that time to understand every single business line or functional line with inside the organization, we are we'll be continually spinning that wheel. So what we mean by that is having the types of conversation, which is what we recommend to our people is to say, you know, so let's take the head of finance as an example. Talk to me about your function. Talk to me about what your function needs to look like in the next 12 months to add value to the organization. What is the what do your function need to be known as? What do you want to be known as? And if you think about that, whatever that is, how are you going to achieve that and then how are you going to build on the reputation? So until we truly understand that for each one of our business lines and each one of our functions, it's quite hard to go out there and try and find the right cultural fit. What tends to happen inside organizations is we say, hey, this is our culture. It's an overarching culture across the whole organization. Well, we all know the reality of that is we have subsets of that with inside those different functions and inside those different kingdoms and feed them inside an organization. So our belief is that the starting point of great strategic talent acquisition is to spend the time to truly understand what it is that that business head is trying to achieve. And also at the same time, explain to them that this is not a responsibility of HR or talent acquisition. This is a joint responsibility. And obviously we're biased, but talent acquisition and talent retention should be at the top of everybody's priority list. You know, great people make great organizations. It's, it's you know, that's a no-brainer. So to really get them to understand that this is a partnership and to spend that time and energy to open their business to you and open their function to you and open their desires and their objectives so that you're all on the same page. Um, that in that way that you can then start thinking, okay, now I understand the types of people that we're looking for and the types of skill sets and the cultural fit, etc. Now we can start to actually build a strategic talent acquisition roadmap. We look at that in these three ways, and you know, I'll be going through these slides fairly quickly, but they will be available afterwards, so don't worry too much about that. Um, so that sourcing piece. You know, I'll get into these in more detail. These are the four things to look at, market mapping, talent mapping, market intelligence, and looking for that, being very proactive about that. Um, you know, we, we passionately believe that you're better to go shopping when you're not hungry. You know, if you go to the supermarket when you're starving, you'll end up buying all sorts of things that you'll never eat. It's far better. It's the same thing when you're trying to hire talent. If you can get ahead of the game, you're always going to raise that bar of quality. Diversity and inclusion. Again, I think all the organizations understand the power of that now. I'm just very glad to say I don't think it's box ticking anymore. It's truly understanding the power of diversity and inclusion. Um, we see that you know, the, um, the, the value of that, the way that that can help organizations drive and grow in this global economy they're living in is, 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 is phenomenal. And then the third piece is the marketing. So how are we actually positioning ourselves in the market, what do we stand for, who are we, how are we creating that brand, and how are we then delivering on that promise and making it palatable and digestible in the open marketplace. But I'll dig into these in more detail. But that's the way we think about the CD talent acquisition. And then once you've got that, you can then say take that sourcing piece of it. And this, to us, this is um, where we've had lots of success, pardon the pun, is by using success profiles. And again, in a crazy world of talent acquisition, when we're spinning those plates and we're just trying to fill wrecks, sometimes we can just get into that constant, constant cycle of not taking the time to truly, truly understand what does a success profile look like of the great people inside our organization. So a, a, you know, a, a simple example of that would be to say to you're having that conversation with your head of sales and saying, okay, I need exposure and I need time and effort and energy from your six to ten top salespeople in this particular business line. I want them to commit to spend some time with me. 
I'm going to lock them in a room for half a day and I'm going to get them to help me understand what gets them excited, what gets them waking up in the morning with a smile on their face. What is it about those individuals? Where is the synergy that we can pinpoint to start hiring more of the same? Again, it sounds blindingly obvious, but if you don't take the time to do it, it's very easy to miss that. And that's not just the salespeople, of course, that's where any particular function. So the, the approach that we take is almost creating an avatar of this is the perfect person for this function and, uh, and this particular skill set and job set. And that means that they're very successful. It also means we get great tenure. also means they're great talent ambassadors to the organization. They're the sort of individual that will attract other individuals to the company because they're there. They're the positive ones. They're the ones that are always doing great. They're the ones that are rallying the troops. Don't get um, any any negativity, and they don't let that um, pass on to them. And create that success profile, not for every particular job, but for those serial jobs that you're hiring all the time, for those really niche ones, for those really important ones, and spending the time to do that, and then get that sign off from that business head to say, okay, so what we're saying our absolute perfect person looks like this. They might not exist, but that's our that's our goal that we're going after. So we then have a benchmark to source against. Once you've built that, you can then get into the, all of your different sourcing um, strategies and tools and techniques, again, which I'll dive into. And out of the other end comes these correct candidates. By spending that time up front to create those almost graphic, and sometimes we go that far, graphic avatar of what that, what that individual looks like, number of years, skill set, culture, et cetera, et cetera, then um, we can then start building talent pools and communities of those people. So we're hiring or, and attracting against that success profile, not filling the, we're not trying to fill the jobs at that point. So typically, you know, depending on the size of your organization, if you have the um, the good fortune to have a um, sizable function, think about okay, which looking at my team and their skill sets, which of those people are better equipped to be filling the funnel, and which of those people are better equipped to actually be um, pitching that candidate, selling the compelling story, and closing them down and getting them on board. It's a different job, it's a different skill set. How can I? Um, position my people within my team so that I have some of them going out to market through marketing and through headhunting and everything else, finding these people against this success profile, and how can I have other people then hunting in that pool of people that have been pre-identified and perhaps warmed up to an extent to do the sell, to pitch the compelling story, to get them on board. Um, so that's what we mean by creating that success profile instead of just trying to fill jobs every day. And I'm not demeaning just trying to fill jobs, but you get my point. It's about creating that profile, not just here's a job description with a person description attached to it. So we see three types of candidates in the marketplace, and you'll see a poll question pop up. Um, please feel free to, to vote away. Um, the, three, the two obvious ones that are spoken about a lot are the active candidates, those people that are applying to jobs. And as we know, you can apply to 200 jobs with a click of a button these days. Um, and we also have the, the passive candidates. Those are the ones that are not openly looking right now. It's not as Gilbert describes here, although that is quite humorous, a uh, way of looking at passive. What we're saying is that these people um, are not actively on the market. But the interesting thing we've found over the years and, and more and more recently, and the, the biggest if you think of these three buckets of cohorts, the biggest co growth of cohort is that middle one of the passing candidates. These are the window shoppers. These are the people that are saying, hey, I'm not quite looking, I'm not aggressively looking, but I'd be open to opportunity. I think, you know, it's the difference between when Monster first was launched, uh, when I was at TMP at the time, actually, when we launched Monster, um, that was a job board, and you had to openly say you're looking for a job and people are a bit reticent to do that because, hey, my boss might see me on there. Now, with LinkedIn, we're all just networking and you actually network with your boss on LinkedIn, which is rather bizarre because we all know really it's probably the biggest job board in the world. Um, so as we're seeing here, the results are in. 71% of active and 14% of passing and no, and no passive um, uh, the reason we ask that question is that um, 
what we see and we you know, we're obsessed and paranoid about analytics and data when we hire people and track them through their success in an organization and there's an absolute direct line of synergy between passive candidates and successful candidates that isn't saying active candidates are bad but if you collect the data and analyze the data there's a higher propensity of success with passive than there is with active. So what we're trying to do is hire happy, successful people who are very happy in their job and give them a compelling reason to join that new organization. So if we dig deeper into how we think of that world with these three cohorts is and we take these four quadrants of there's four things that we do <laughs> to these people uh, in a nice, pleasant way. There's four things that we do. We push messages to them. We engage them. We pull them, as opposed to push messaging. We actually find them and pull them. And then we re-engage to keep them warm through the life cycle. So now with the advent of talent pools and talent communities, this isn't just a one-time event. This isn't just about posting a job or pitching somebody and then forgetting about them. It's continually building that pool of people based against those success profiles to actually develop and build a relationship because we might hire them today, we might hire them tomorrow, we might hire them in a couple of years' time. And again, there's a lot of content here, so um, this is more for further reading later, but just to give you an idea of the way we think about this, in each one of those quadrants, we use different strategies to push, engage, pull, or re-engage. So, um, for example, um, some of that re-engage, thinking about somebody that might have worked for you before as a contractor. Do we have the ability to actually re-engage them to talk to them about a, a permanent position? You know, how are we how are we keeping their data? What sort of a, how are we getting them into the ATS or how are we getting them out of the VMS into a database, etc. Um, in terms of engaging these people, thinking about having as many possible points of entry for that individual as possible. Um, these are all for those active people, of course. Because these are people are seeking these things out. So you might have your Twitter feed, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, etc. In terms of the um, the passing candidates, these are the people, the window shoppers. Again, are these are the different methods we're using. Um, it may be that by having a, um, for example, on the re-engagement, if you're having somebody you've got a relationship with, you might have spoken to them a while ago, you had a quick conversation about a position, but they're like, yeah, interesting, but not just yet, thank you. How can we, you know, we've, we then create a new EVP, might be the time to go back to that person. How do we do that? How do we, what language do we use when we're speaking to a passing candidate as opposed to an active candidate? Spend that time to think about, you know, what is the message that's telling them? If they're not actively looking, you, you know, we don't like to get that open response from somebody as if we were. It puts us off before we even read the rest of the emails. So what language are we using, and do we have the ability to actually classify these people um, as these various cohorts? And then the last piece around the passive: what are we doing to um, to pull those people into our talent pool? Um, how are we? One of the biggest things here is having that strong internal EVP to turn your employees into talent ambassadors. Um, you know, what sort of employer referral program do we have? Do we are we making that easy for our individuals to push that to those passive candidates that aren't looking? What channels are we going over and above the normal the job board routes? Um, you know, how are we how are we set up as a you know how good are we at headhunting? What's our intelligence like in terms of our competitors? Do we track our competitors somewhere else inside the organisation? And can that intel be brought into the talent acquisition function? Um, and a slightly different way of looking at this is the strategic sourcing framework, and again, you'll see a poll question pop up. So we don't only think about our strategy in those different quadrants, we also think about what are the different tools and channels that we can use. And rather than, you know, I think that um, LinkedIn has grown so much over the years that some organizations just become too reliant on that. Um, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't be using it. Um, obviously, we use it, and it's a phenomenal source and starting point to find people, but it isn't the only one. You know, are, are we using the right tools to push those messages out? 
uh, do we understand where those types of success profiles are actually, if they are being active, where do they look? If they're not being active, uh, we've got to go and find them, where do they hang out? Um, and always, the answers are within. So while you're having that session, come back to those 10 salespeople. You know, if they were to be on the market, where would they look? And the fact that they're not on the market, where do they hang out online every day? Uh, engineers uh, tend to you know, go hang out with other engineers to find out answers. Where are we? Where can we set ourselves up? Where can we set our stall to get involved in communities that aren't necessarily about job hunting or moving careers, but it's where like-minded people um, actually hang out? And as we'd expect, most people are using a few of these. I think it's again, it's just worth spending some time talking to your employees. And every candidate you interview, by the way, um, just to continually be, build that intelligence around where do these people hang out online when they're not looking, and what sort of messages can we get to them? A good example of that would be one of our global technology companies. They had a great um, blog platform, and they were you know, great bloggers, but the way they were doing that was that the, they were blogging as the company with the individual being the author. And what we were able to convince them to do is to turn it on its head and so get your get the person at the forefront and then you know mention in the blog who they work for. A very subtle difference, but the the impact we saw in some really, really niche IT skills across Europe actually was that that person's network were actually attracted to that person, were attracted to the interest level of that guy's, uh, in this case, the guy's um, level of knowledge about a specific um, IT application. So we're drawn into that, and by osmosis, they're seeing where he works, realize that he's given that freedom to blog, representing the organization, but also being allowed to be an individual. And that happened to be one of their values. So subtle little things like that to think about, you know, are we representing ourselves in the market as this big corporation, or are we allowing our individuals to show that individualism and then to attract people based on their brand? Because now all of a sudden you've not just got your own employer brand, you've got your, you know, your, a, a certain amount of employees that are out there with using their personal brand to actually attract people to the organization. Um, I'm not saying turn them into headhunters, but it's pretty close to that. People are attracted to people, as we all know. So again, it's worth doing a bit of an um, audit in terms of, okay, what are we using? What tools are we using? Which tools do we think are better for which cohort of active passing and, and um, passing? And how are we measuring that impact? It's always a those of you that spend money on any of this will know that when you sit down with the uh, CFO, the first question is, what's the ROI? Um, and sometimes that's possible. Sometimes it's impossible because some of this activity, some might cost money, some might cost just resource, but some of that will be subliminal marketing and messaging that it's quite hard sometimes to track back an actual hire to that activity. But again, if your ATS is not set up in a way to try and get as close to that fact as possible, then you'll be doing that forever. You'll be failing forever trying to prove that ROI. I think one of the worst things I see on career sites is that drop down that says other or miscellaneous or our career website. What typically happens, people hear about your organization somewhere, go onto your career site to apply, and then just click the easiest button, which is either the first one or some other miscellaneous button. You need to get rid of those and find a way of tracking people back to the fact that they saw a tweet or whatever. And some of that can be built into the interview process as well. This isn't easy. It's all about catching that detail, but it pays dividends time and time again if you really, really pay attention to that. Another way of looking at that is thinking about um, all of those different tools, and you can see a good display of them here. Um, again, active passing, um, active, sorry, active passing and passing. 
I'm not saying you should use all of these, but some of these will be more successful for you than others. So we thought it'd be helpful just to list as all the ones that, well, not all of them, but the majority of the ones that we use in different parts of the world for different skill sets. Think about, you know, have we tried some of these out? Is it worth having a trial of these? What are our what do our people internally think about them? Who uses these? Just to make sure that you're not missing out on anything. I think sometimes what we find now is that a lot of candidates are actually um, turning off their LinkedIn profile or they're ignoring in-mails because they're getting so many and it's almost becoming commoditized. So we're continually thinking about let's find different ways to do that. And if you've never heard of them before and they're a bit niche, that's probably a good thing because the candidate will, you know, if they're involved in that, will be attracted and impressed by the fact that you've found them that way as opposed to the what's becoming a lazy recruiter way of LinkedIn. So again, uh, one for the records once you get this, um, these slides afterwards. So once we've got all that information, once we have that ability, let's dig into that other section, which is really, really important of the talent mapping. So what we tend to do, um, and our recommendation to clients as they think about this, and again, you can't do this for every single uh, job you're trying to fill, but for those hard to fill roles, or you might want to replace the hard to fill with serial positions, those that you're always hiring, therefore it's worth investing in the energy and effort to do this. Um, providing competitor lists, so when we think about competitor lists, this isn't just saying, hey, here's our competitors, it's also, what are they doing to attract great talent? Any of you that are involved in call center activity will know that that's an ongoing uh, observation you need to do, you know, how are they attracting our people to walk across the street, what are their latest benefits they're giving, and what are they doing in the marketplace, are we seeing any activity ramp up from those competitors, what does that mean from a retention perspective, does that leave us exposed, do we need to revisit um, the way that we are positioning our benefits compared to what our competitors are saying. Um, creating a slate of candidates is pretty obvious, and uh, again, that's through that success profile and being proactive, uh, and then thinking about what social communities do these people hang out in. Um, we find that not everybody is an expert at creating Boolean search strings. Find those people that are, and help get them to um, build those for the rest of the team, not just for themselves. Um, otherwise, people that aren't so good at that will be spending far too much time doing that rather than being on the phone speaking to candidates. There's a plenty of information out there these days on supply and demand, thinking about if you're working with your business line, having that strategic conversation about where are we going to grow our business by talent and headcount next year, having that knowledge of where the talent is is invaluable. Um, you know, if Do we need to hire another 300 people in Bristol? Is there any way that we can put them in other parts of the country for example, where the, uh, the supply is greater and the demand isn't quite so high. Do we really want to be fishing in the same pool as everybody else every single time? Creating that data and that intelligence will help change the conversation that you're having with the, with the business head. Um, the compensation ranges, again, I think that, that as recruiters, it's always a constant battle for us. And I think the key to that is having data, not just being subjective about it, oh, I can't fill your position because you're not paying enough, doesn't really fly. Um, so it's about how can we collect that, com that uh, compensation delta and data points to be feeding back scientifically to make a case. Um, and, then, and then the last piece there, the alternative locations, which is thinking outside the box and leveraging um, places, information where you wouldn't normally look. Um, and I guess most of us as recruiters would think about looking at the conferences people attend, but you know that that's still not a bad way of finding out. You can get hold of delegate lists, attendee lists, those sorts of things in terms of over and above just trawling through the usual places, what can I actually do to, to gather more and more data? So that's what we call a talent map. It has all those elements to it. Um, what we then do is build this, as you can see, on targeted role. We all start building these heat maps, supply and demand, salary chain, and all of this, all of this um, information is, um, depending on you know, who you're partnering with, is, is very available. I'm not going to call out which companies do that. I'm sure you know they are, but um, 
want to ask me afterwards offline, I'll share that, but I don't want to be seen to be craving one or another. We tend to work with you know, a few of the of the best we, we believe are can provide us this information. Um, but having this type of intelligence when you when the recruiter walks into that intake session or that briefing session with the line manager, I'm repeating myself, but it completely changes the conversation. It allows the recruiter to drive the strategy as opposed to the line manager always thinking they know what's best which might mean, oh, let's put an ad in the paper because I want to see my name up here. Um, so, um, you know, this is about, you know, we understand the marketplace. We're here as your talent advisor. I'm not here just to fill your jobs. Let me have an intelligent conversation about what's going on with your competitors, um, your competitors for our business and also your competitors for our, the talent that we're looking for. Um, and let's say and a good example of that would be heat maps. Um, which again uh, you can get hold of pretty pretty easily. I would strongly recommend the way we think about this is from a competitive intelligence is to build organisation charts. Um, and again, I've done this many times. If you, particularly in the sales arena, if you walk into an intake session, a briefing session with a sales director, and you put on the you know on the desk in front of him, his one of the two or three of his competitors' organisation charts doesn't just tell you who you can go after, it also shows how they run their business. Um, again, it just elevates that conversation completely. And in today's world of transparency, it's much easier to get this than certainly when I started in the industry 30 odd years ago. I used to have to phone the receptionist with a pseudonym. I mean, I'm sure you remember those days of headhunting. Um, the world has changed somewhat now. Um, there's, there are far more ways of doing this. But again, think about your team who has the ability to do this, who's better doing this than is actually picking the phone up. If it's a small team, of course, they're likely to be 360 degrees of doing both. But if you have a sizable team, our recommendation would always be to, to delineate those um, responsibilities and actions and get people to play to their strengths. Some people love doing this research stuff. It's also worth thinking about, because this is a research piece, is this something that we can get our entry level recruiters doing or can I get some grads doing this? Um, you know, people just coming out of university would be you know, used to this method of working and style of working and research and much better. I mean, our, our strategic talent acquisition team, our researchers, I think there's not one over the age of 28 and they're far better at this than I am um, because it's all they've ever known. So think about that. You know, is this a different role that you can actually get done for rather than paying a recruiter salary, is there a different level of salary for somebody to do this type of work and type of activity? Um, and again, all the search engines you can possibly think of, to the way you think about this, don't just rely on Google. We all love Google, of course, but sometimes you find different results, as you know, by using different search engines um, and not just relying on LinkedIn. Think about all these different ones to do um, where people you just find different it's different lens of looking at people. Um, and again, um, this is you know it, it, having this sort of information in intake session, it just impresses people um, just to make sure that they, they understand that you are not just a recruiter or just out there to go and fill their job for them. You're there to actually add value on their strategy about the way they think about talent. Um, the last piece on that section I would talk to is employer referral programs. Um, I'm, I'm staggered by the amount of times when I'm speaking to prospects and ask that question about, you know, talk to me about your employer referral program. The common answer is, oh yeah, I think I think we've got one of those, or we used to have one, and I'm not quite sure the detail and how much do we pay again? And you know, and I, and I think we all know and understand that great people refer great people, so. Mm -hmm. I would think that from a target wise, if you think of your external hires, my view is that you should be targeting over 50% of those coming from the employer referral program. Now that varies depending on the industry and the location and availability of talent, etc. Um, but it's worth thinking about, and you might want to do that by skill set, you might want to do it by geography, but actually set some targets in terms of what do we think we should be achieving 
And then how do we incentivize our people to do that? And any of you that have read Dan Pink or seen Dan Pink talk about motivation, this is not just about money. And sometimes it's not about money at all. Um, sometimes actually having a bounty payment at certain levels can actually put people off. Um, senior execs don't like to be seen to be taking money to refer to people. Um, down at the other end of the scale, they tend to be more effective in a call center environment where you know, 500 pounds or $1,000 or something is, is a big impact. But think about what's actually more important is how easy is it for me as an employee to refer somebody? And does that person get followed up on? Because this is my friend, I don't want to get them excited and I never hear again. That's the common complaint we hear within prospects of why they, you know, sometimes the referral program has, has disappeared or, or been diluted. So is the organization truly set up to treat these people very specially? How, how do we do that? What information are we giving to our employees to be able to pass on? And how easy do we make it for them to refer to somebody, whether that be through your ATS technology platform or platform that you're looking at right now, which is a um, product we use in some of our accounts. So, you know, how engaging is it? Also, the key to this as we see this is how can we turn this on its head? So the way that we think about this is we have the technology, the employer referral technology scouring our, the ATS every day, looking at the open positions, and then looking at the network of all the employees that have signed up and looking at that individual, those employees' network, and then rather than hoping Mary Jo walks in tomorrow morning and says, oh, I wonder if we're looking for any of this particular skill set, searches on your internet, find, tries to find some jobs, and then tries to find some people she knows. By turning it on its head, the technology is actually scouting those new jobs based on that requirement, looking at your all of your employees that have signed up to the talent community, looking at their network, and then sending a message, hey, Mary Jo, I, we're looking for an app developer. I noticed that you're connected to somebody first degree on LinkedIn. Could you push on this message, please? And all Mary Jo has to do is push a button. Sure. The other thing we get success with, with rather than using money, is to actually set up um, geographies or divisions or functions against each other and create a point system whereby each employee is getting points for referring, more points if that person gets interviewed, and a lot more points if they get hired in their day after three months, that sort of thing. And then those points are aggregated in each function or division or geography, and then the winning team or the winning part of the business gets a, uh, a check to go and do some good in the community. We have great success with that because it gives exposure. You can do some follow-up, you know, promote that in your internal newsletter. Hey, our finance division won last quarter's employee referral program with so many points, and here they are doing some great good in the community with the cash that they won. Um, and it makes people feel good about themselves, but it just keeps it in the public eye, so to speak. So again, if you're not doing, if you're not intently looking at your employee referral program or you're not really happy with that, another area worth spending a lot of time. And the last piece is around, um, once you've got these people, is to build what we call a talent platform. So we see organizations now um, thinking about themselves more and more as talent platforms so instead of companies. What we mean by that is, if you think about the, the way you attract people does that really live up to, or does the way that you, they work with those people actually live up to that mm -hmm. promise? Um, and the, the great question, and this is one of those, if there's only one question you take away from today, this is it, um, thinking about how easy do we make it for our people to do great work. So, you know, when I go inside our client organizations and I'm part of those sessions where our um, head of talent acquisition is speaking to a business head or a functional head. That's the question I use every single time and it's just it's it's just such a powerful question to think about, you know, our our commitment to you, Mr. Head of or Mrs. Head of something, is to go and attract and find and onboard this great talent. What you need to do in return, over and above being part of that, is to actually make sure that they 
they are successful here and they stay here. And to do that, you've just got to make it easy for them to do great work. So in other words, when we talk about our employer brand and we talk about our culture and we talk about the way that we work, are we actually living up to that? Don't tell me to go and find great innovative people if you're going to put them in a cubicle and not listen to any of their ideas. It gives us the ability to push back. And again, it's just by having this conversation around the talent platform. And what we mean by that in simple terms is create a platform where people are motivated, engaged, empowered, and rewarded to do great work. Then it's just going to attract more and more people. It gets that excitement, and they're more likely to be talent ambassadors. So when you think about putting a talent acquisition hat on, whether that's 100% of your job or whether it's part of your job in HR, think about how can I expand the power and influence of talent acquisition. It's about having conversations like this in terms of you know, what, what are we doing to make sure that we're really living up to that reputation that we're putting in the marketplace. And then that ties back, of course, into the employer brand. Um, so I know I've, I've um, given you a lot, a hell of a lot of information today in 40 plus very short minutes, but I did want to leave time for questions. Um, and I think that I deliberately built the deck in a way that can be a reference point for you as you hopefully um, get motivated by today's session to actually create your own action plan inside your organization and take some time to take that step back and say, you know, from a strategic talent acquisition perspective, are we really looking at this strategically and are we taking the time to think about the way that we attract, engage, and retain talent? Or are we in this, are we the hamster in the wheel just spinning plates and filling wrecks? Um, we, yeah, we, my view is you just have to take that time, find that time to have those deep and meaningful we need to talk conversations with each of the business heads. So um, in summary, um, and always nice to have a summary in these things as, a, as an action plan, speak to your business heads, and I'm not saying you're not right now, and I'm sure all of you are doing everything I'm saying, but those, those that are, perhaps just think about that. What is the, you know, how can I prepare for that conversation? What are those, some of those great killer strategic questions that I can ask to change that conversation? Um, once you have that information, and only once you have that, and understand that success profile of those positions or of those profiles within inside that function, can you create a talent acquisition strategy around that, build that roadmap, get back into the business head, talk that through with them, you might even want to co-create it, but get their buy-in and get them to understand how much work and effort and energy that you're doing. This isn't just about you emailing them or forwarding them three resumes or CVs. But sometimes they think that's what we do. Sometimes they think we've got a, one of those clay potter's wheel in the back creating and uh, manufacturing these candidates. Being proactive, and again, much easier said than done, I know, but the further ahead we can get of this, not just spending every waking minute just filling the wrecks that are open, finding some delineations that you can have part of your team or perhaps a, an extension of your team actually purely concentrating on being proactive, not getting dragged into those, a hey, line manager X wants you know, his head's on fire, we need to go and find some people for him, because you'll soon get dragged back into that tactical, give them the space to be proactive and build those talent pools. And when you think about those talent pools, you, it's not good enough just to build them, you've got to keep them engaged. So what can you do once people have signed up to your talent pool or your talent community? What can you do to turn them into communities? How, what interesting information can we be communicating to them? As a rule of thumb, we like to use the 70-30 um, rule, so on t where we manage Twitter accounts for our clients. 70% of the content that we push out has nothing to do with jobs. It has to do with the company or that industry or that specific skill set. And 30% is talking about opportunities. Um, one of the reasons we do that is that we find if you're just pushing people jobs, they'll just stop following you or just won't even read the stuff. So it, it has to be adding value to them, and that's around, you know, and that, that, isn't, you know that, that needs energy and effort and, and resource. So, you know, who's the community manager? Who's wearing that hat? 
to be understanding that community well enough to be driving the the content that's um, interesting to them that will help subliminally raise the profile of your brand within within their minds. Next piece, um, turn employees into talent ambassadors. That's not just the referral program. It's getting people to understand that this should be number one on everybody's list. Um, if you know, I think the CEO's job should be the CTO, Chief Talent Officer. If all the CEO did was attract great talent to the organization, they could play golf. Um, I'm generalizing, of course. But you know, it should be in front of everybody's mm -hmm. mind, how do I attract great talent to this organization? And what am I doing on a day-to-day -day and week-in, week-out basis to add to that? Um, and then the last piece is, and again, great way to have a conversation with those business managers is what are we doing as an organization to move from a static company to actually become a talent platform where people will be attracted to come here and once they're here, be engaged and empowered and rewarded to do their very, very best work. If they're allowed and encouraged and rewarded to do their very best work, they'll stay. People don't move if they're, if they're able to do that. I think it's just a part of our DNA as human beings is we want to do great work every day. Um, and as long as we can do that and it's recognized, then we'll stay. So we have just over 10 minutes left um, to take some questions. Um, and I have had a few come in. So if, while people are thinking of any others, let me just read these to you and then respond if I can. So first question has come in saying, what are the first steps we should take to change our recruitment method? Um, and I think I've sort of covered that on the call, but I'll, I'll just go through that again. I think that the first steps uh, has to be around understanding who are your internal clients, who are those business heads or functional heads, truly understanding the way the organization operates, and then setting up those conversations and not allowing it to be a 20-minute phone call, <laughs> really pushing for a face-to-face -face, you know, for at least an hour, hour and a half to not talk about live requisitions, jobs they're trying to fill, but having that conversation about what keeps them awake at night, what are their business objectives and desires for the next 12 to 18 months, how can you as their talent partner help with that? How are you going to, you know, I love asking that question to a head of business saying, you know, today is whatever the date is, September the 10th or something. If it's now September the 10th, 2016, and you're buying me a great meal and giving me champagne because it's been a successful year, what have we achieved together? Let's get that captured. Let's get that vision created and written down and recorded so that you then know as you're serving that internal customer, you're on the same page and, you, and you, you've, there's no mismatch of vision. Um, so I think that's where the that's where the starting point is, and until you've had those conversations, don't even think about the methodology you're using, because it could be wrong. A lot of a lot of people, a lot of organisations spend a lot of time answering the wrong question really well, <laughs> solving the wrong challenge really well. Let's truly understand what that challenge is before we even think about building the model or the methodology. Um, I think the 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 second question that came in actually is pretty similar, but I'll read it out. What are some of the best ways to evaluate our recruitment methods? Again, I think that that comes off the back of those conversations with the, with the businesses and then saying, okay, based on that need and that objective, let's revisit and let's audit the methodology that we're using at the moment and the tools that we're using at the moment. Let's make sure that we are um, surveying all of our candidates that go through the process, not just the starters, to understand what what improvements could be. It might be that the your employer brand messaging isn't coming through consistently in that recruitment process, you know, those 20 touch points you have with a candidate. It might be that you know, somebody's been interviewed four times and been asked the same questions four times. You know, do an audit of that, do a diagnostic. Almost imagine yourself being an internal consultant, you know, and looking stepping outside and looking um, see the, the um, looking from outside and doing a diagnostic and, and a discovery of the current methods. And the third question is, I think, is a is a common one on a lot of people's minds: is um, I'm struggling to get 
I want to see. I'm starting to get buy-in to get up and running. What do you suggest? Um, well, because a lot of that comes back to that first conversation again. But think about when you set that meeting up, what information do we already have or what information could I gain so that when I'm having that conversation, the, the person across the desk understands that I know what I'm talking about, understands that I know um, relatively um, a great amount of detail about their business, about their skill sets they're trying to hire. Look at their organogram, look who they employ in that function, and then do some of that market mapping so you can go in there armed. So when they say, yeah, one of my biggest challenges is I need to hire another 100 people in this location, so well, that's interesting. Look at the supply and demand going on in that particular geography. I think by having that, raising the conversation, so you're talking about how they're going to achieve their business objective, what impact is that going to have on the whole organization's profitability, share price, etc., will absolutely get that buy-in as opposed to can you give me more detail in the job description, please, and what are the benefits? You know, in order to stop being a recruiter, and I'm using that term derogatory for a second, stop being the person that sits in front of somebody with a pad taking down a job description and having that different level of conversation. And the last question we have in for now is which sourcing strategy do you find the most effective and why? <laughs> um, Great question and almost impossible to answer because it varies on type of skill set we're looking for, length of tenure and geography. Um, but if we if we looked at the different channels, if I answered it slightly differently, which sourcing channels do we find the most effective? Um, in terms of success of that candidate and the tenure of that candidate, um, I would say with hands down it's um, employee referrals. They tend to be the best candidates, followed by passive, passing, and then active at the bottom of the list. Um, and that, you know, we obviously have some anomalies in some clients, but generically, if you look across all of them, look at percentage-wise, um, that's the way it goes. Employee referrals first, then passive, then passing, then active. Um, and that's all the questions I have in for now. Um, I don't know, oh, it might be... Um, oh, I've got sorry, so I'm going two more. Um, for a company that is a beginner on technology and social media, um, job using job boards, um, SSC, LinkedIn, what would be the next big step? Um, and again, um, I, won't, I was going to say your name then, but I'll keep confidentiality. I think that um, I think the next step would be to understand um, from a the technology that you're already using. Do you have the ability to prove any ROI and get a feel for the type of budget that you might have for the next 12 months based on projected hires so you know the parameters you have to work within. And sometimes when you're trying to pitch to whoever holds the cash to pay for these things, um, if you can replace some of what you're currently doing because you've proven that it isn't successful as somewhere else, and it's a bit of a swap out plus a bit of an increase that tends to be, um, in my experience, easier to sell than just say, hey, I need another X amount of um, pounds, please. Um, I think that the important piece when you're thinking about social media is it's not a one trick. Um, you've got to be, if you're in it, you've got to be in it. Um, you can't just push out some messages and ignore them. That will have the opposite impact. So I think it's about if you're thinking about social media, again, go back to what are those target markets I'm looking to attract. We've already got some of those in the organization. Have conversations with them. Find out what social media they're on, which ones that they would take um, interest when thinks about their career, so you're choosing the right sort. And then try some out. You know, Just put your toe in the water and try a few of those, but knowing that um, if you get too much exposure, you have to follow it through. So I think, again, it's about breaking down your types of skill sets and your type of success profiles and then having those internal workshop sessions to find out what would be what would they be most likely to be impacted by and when it comes to social media. The last piece is, um, the last question is, in your opinion, what is the best source of talent in terms of global media supply? 
question mark LinkedIn. Um, I think that um, in terms of global media, I think that I would think about are we looking for people inside organizations that have that responsibility or are we looking for those people in the agencies and that would depend on the type of work that you're trying to get done. Um, sometimes a head of media or somebody senior in media or anything else for that matter in terms of creative inside an organization aren't necessarily the people that do that. They're the people that call in the people to do it. Um, so I think that would be my first question based around that. And then I would definitely, um, I think LinkedIn would be a great starting point in terms of finding those communities where your employees that are already in those roles that you're looking to fill in the future, which communities do they belong to and how can you get involved in those? But genuinely get involved. Don't be the recruiter that's just trying to take. Um, how do you get involved and get your employees to become talent ambassadors within those communities by saying great things about your organization. And then once they've built those relationships, um, entice people, attract them into a talent community, as opposed to just trying to hire them straight up, would be my view. So on that note, um, I think that was the last question coming in. So thank you, everybody, for your time and attention. Hopefully, you were able to find a couple of nuggets out of there today. And I'll hand back to Akil to close up. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce. That was a really interesting uh, webinar there. Um, I, hope, I hope everyone uh, got a lot out of it. Um, Bruce, do you have any final messages for your attendees before I wrap up and uh, let them know what happens from here? No, I think I'd just say that you know, if you have any further questions or detail, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I think my info, oh, there you go, my information is there, thanks, Akil. Um, and um, I think, Akil, the, the, I'm right to say the webinar is shared with the attendees afterwards if people want to go back in and spend more time on any particular slides. Yes, that's correct. So um, the session has been recorded and will be made available with a copy of the presentation slides um, in three working days, uh, and we'll send you all an email um, with the link that you need to access it. So um, thank you very much for joining us today on this WTG webinar. A big thank you to Allegis Global Solutions and especially to Bruce Morton for taking the time to give a very, very interesting presentation. Um, before I let you go, uh, just a quick point. Um, if you could please take the time to fill in our post-event survey and leave your feedback, we'd be really grateful and it will help us um, create, a, uh, you know, improve our webinars in the future. Um, one final thanks to our sponsor, Allegis uh, Global Solutions, and all you live attendees. This session is now over. Um, goodbye, and have a great day.